In earlier videos, I've talked about Bohr's atomic model and about electron configurations. I've also mentioned a few simple rules for how to write electron configurations for different types of atoms. But nothing is ever as simple as you think at first. Bohr's atomic model is really good and works really well for the hydrogen atom. But for the other atoms, well, we have to extend it a little bit. Bohr's atomic model essentially describes the hydrogen atom like this, that the electrons move around the nucleus in shells or at different energy levels. We call these shells the K shell, the L shell, the M shell, and so on. But for larger atoms with higher atomic numbers, the electron's behavior is more complex and we must use other models. But first, we have to consider what an electron is and what it isn't. It's easy to imagine the electron as a little marble or a little dot that zooms around the nucleus like a planet around the sun. But this is not the case. Rather, the electron is smeared in both time and space. Yeah, it actually is. This means that it isn't possible to determine both the speed and position simultaneously of an electron. If you try to determine its speed accurately, its position becomes unclear. And if you try to determine its position accurately, its speed becomes unclear. But it becomes even stranger. It's not only impossible to determine, the electron actually doesn't have a well-defined position and speed at any given moment. This is the fundamental mystery of quantum mechanics, but it is actually the way an electron behaves. Because of this, it's only possible to determine where an electron is with some possibility. This possibility may be described by a mathematical function. And for the K shell in the hydrogen atom, the function describes a sphere like this. And because you can only tell where the electron is with some possibility, we rather say that the electron resides in sort of a cloud around the nucleus, an electron cloud. Now, you already know that different shells can contain different number of electrons. In each shell, the electrons have the same average energy. But there are, within each shell, different sublevels. These sublevels are called orbitals. We write this down too, that the electrons may reside in different energy levels, orbitals, within the same shell. Also, all the electrons in a certain shell have the same average energy. For now, you must also keep in mind that each orbital may only contain one or two electrons. Now, let's start by looking at the K shell in more detail. It only has one orbital and it's called 1s. It's spherical, as I showed you before. We first consider the hydrogen atom, which has the atomic number 1. We also draw a diagram here to the right with the energy level on the y-axis. When electrons are in the K shell, their energy is as low as possible. We draw this energy level here and write a K for the K shell. The single orbital in the K shell is called 1s, and in hydrogen it contains a single electron. But don't copy this diagram just yet, I'll make a lot of changes to it before it's finished. As I said earlier, each orbital may contain two electrons, and so with two electrons here, it's helium we're talking about. So in helium, which has the atomic number 2, there are two electrons in the 1s orbital in the K shell. For heavier atoms, we must now move up to the L shell. The L shell contains four orbitals on two different energy levels. The first orbital is an s orbital and is called 2s. Then there are three p orbitals called 2p. In this picture, the 1s orbital is the red small half sphere here and the 2s orbital is the blue sphere surrounding it. The 2p orbitals look very different from this. Sometimes they're called dumbbell shaped and obviously the way I draw them here is far from what they really look like. I draw them like this for two reasons. First of all, they're hopefully quite easy for you to copy to your notes. Second, I want you to note how they are oriented along the x, y and z axis perpendicular to each other. Now let's draw this in our diagram too and you should write these down too. 
The L shell contains orbitals on two different energy levels. There is the 2s orbital down here and the 2p orbitals here. Since each orbital may contain maximally two electrons, there may be only two electrons in the 2s orbital. In each p orbital, there may also be two electrons, and so in all three of them, there may be up to six electrons. Next, we move up to the m shell, which contains orbitals on three different energy levels. There is one s orbital called 3s, and three p orbitals called 3p, just like in the l shell. There are also 5d orbitals, called 3d. In the diagram, we draw the energy levels like this, and please note the gap between the 3p and 3d orbitals. Now, let's have a look at some atoms, and consider how the electrons are distributed in them. First, we consider argon. Argon's atomic number is 18, and thus it has 18 protons and 18 electrons to distribute. When the electrons are distributed, they are always placed so they have as low energy as possible, essentially as close to the nucleus as possible. This means that the first two electrons in an argon atom ends up in the K shell. The next eight electrons ends up in the L shell, two in the 2s orbital, and two times three equals six in the three 2p orbitals. There are now eight electrons left to distribute, and they of course end up in the M shell two in the 3s orbital, and six in the three 3p orbitals. And, as I said, there are now eight electrons in the m-shell. It is when we get to the next atom that things start to get interesting. To do this, we need to look at the n-shell as well. It has one s orbital, called 4s, three p orbitals, called 4p, five d orbitals, called 4d, and seven f orbitals called 4f. And pay attention to how they're drawn here. The 4s and the 3d orbitals actually overlap. What does this mean for potassium with atomic number 19? Well, the 19th electron isn't placed in the 3d orbital of the m-shell. Instead, it ends up in the 4s orbital of the n-shell, because there its energy is lower. Thus, in the N shell of potassium, there is one electron. The next electron must also be placed in the 4s orbital of the N shell, like this. Now, there are 20 electrons, which means that right now we're looking at how the electrons in calcium are distributed. Now, you know that the 4s orbital can maximally contain two electrons. If we add another one, it must end up in one of the 3d orbitals. This is why scandium, with the atomic number 21, has this electron configuration, with 9 electrons in the m-shell and 2 in the n-shell. Now, there are 5 3d orbitals, and because of this, a total of 10 electrons may be placed in them. Now, we've reached zinc, which has the atomic number 30. As you can see, 18 of its electrons end up in the m-shell, and the n-shell still only has 2 electrons. It's not until we reach atomic number 31 that we can place another electron in the n-shell, now in one of the 4p orbitals. The atom with atomic number 31 is gallium, which then has this electron configuration. If we add another electron to the 4p orbitals, a total of 32 electrons has been distributed. This is the electron configuration of germanium, with four electrons in the n-shell. As you hopefully remember, there are three 4p orbitals, so they may contain six electrons at most. This is the electron configuration of krypton, yet another noble gas. As you can see, it has eight electrons in its n-shell. Now, since there are five 4d orbitals, there may be another 10 electrons there, and since there are seven 4f orbitals, yet another 14 electrons may be there. Now that you've understood how the electrons are distributed, and that the energy levels of the orbitals overlap each other, it's time to learn a rule of thumb for how the electrons are distributed in the different atom species. This is called the Madelung rule, after the German physicist Erwin Madelung, or the Aufbau principle. Now, we draw a diagonal arrow here to show in which the first electrons end up, in the 1s orbital of the k-shell. 
I also write this in the graph to the right. Then I follow up with another diagonal arrow to show that the next two electrons end up in the 2s orbital of the L shell. The next diagonal arrow is drawn like this, and because of this I know that the first two p orbitals are filled with 6 electrons and then the 3s orbital with 2 electrons. It is when we draw the next arrow that we can see that things start to get interesting. The 3p orbitals are filled with electrons and then the 4s orbital, before the 3d orbitals, just like I explained earlier. Can you see what happens next? Yes, then the 3d orbitals are filled and after that the 4p orbitals. When they are filled, the 5s orbital, which I haven't included in this graph, is filled with electrons. This means that the orbitals of the O shell overlap even more with the orbitals of the N shell. Anyway, next to fill up are the 4d orbitals, followed by the 5p and the 6s orbitals. And then we have the 4f, 5d and 6p and so on. This Aufbau principle holds true for most of the atoms of the periodic table, with some 20 exceptions. Finally, let's use the modeling rule to predict the ground states, that is, the electron configurations, for different atoms. Let's start with argon. With help from the modeling rule, we know that there are two electrons in the 1s orbital. We write it like this, 1s2. Then there are two electrons in the 2s orbital, 2s2, six in the 2p orbitals, two in the 3s orbital, and another six in the 3p orbitals. Let's also study zinc with the atomic number 30. Once again, with the help of the modeling rule, we can deduce that there are two electrons in the 1s orbital, two in the 2s orbital, six in the 2p orbitals, two in the 3s orbital, six in the 3p orbitals, two in the 4s orbital, and ten in the 3d orbitals. Now, you can see that I wrote 4s before 3d like this. Some physicists prefer grouping the orbital numbers together so that all orbitals in shell 3 are written together, but you may also write it like this. Can you now also see that this part of the electron configuration is identical to argon? Because of this, the electron configuration of zinc may also be written like this. Finally, don't forget that you can read more and check your learning on my homepage. You'll find a link in the description.